The year is 117 CE, and the Roman Empire under Emperor Trajan is at the height of its economic, political, and military power. The mighty civilization would hold strong for another several hundred years before finally collapsing, in part because nobody could defeat the empire's legionnaires, a well-trained, well-equipped, and rightly feared fighting force. While very few of the empire's contemporaries could stand against these soldiers, what if we introduced a more interesting challenger into the mix? An M1 Abrams tank commonly used by the modern armies of the United States, Iraq, Kuwait, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, transported back to ancient times. That's right! The Roman Empire had plenty of iconic enemies, from the brutal Attila the Hun to the elephant-riding Hannibal of Carthage, but few could pose a real threat to the empire's dominance. So it's perhaps worth asking if any of these enemies had even one operational M1 Abrams, would the sum of Rome's legionnaires be able to stand against them? Would the armored soldiers of the Roman legion go weak at the knees at the approach of an M1's rumbling caterpillar tracks, or would they stand their ground and use their advanced military tactics to win the day against their more physically powerful Full. It's an epic battle between some of the grandfathers of military innovation and one of the 20th and 21st century's most deadly and enduring pieces of hardcore military hardware, employed everywhere from the Persian Gulf War to the modern skirmishes in the Middle East. As in any battle between two legendary forces, we need to first pick their battleground. Thankfully, this is an area where the Roman Empire and the M1 Abrams quite literally have common ground. As we just mentioned, the M1 Abrams cut its teeth in the Persian Gulf Wars, otherwise known as Operation Desert Storm in Iraq. Well over a thousand years earlier, the Roman Empire was fighting against the Sasanian Empire in the latter half of the Roman-Persia Wars, in what would now be known as the neighboring country of Iran. So the Middle East is where the game is set for this clash of military titans. In terms of strategic terrain, Iran and Iraq are famous for their rugged, mountainous environment, a battleground bound to be treacherous for any force that isn't adequately prepared. Hence why guerrilla forces with prior knowledge of an area have always historically had a home team tactical advantage. It's important to remember that largely thanks to improvements in both communication technology and weaponry, modern warfare moves a lot faster than the conflicts of old. The Gulf War didn't last a full year, and the Middle Eastern conflicts with the US that followed haven't lasted 30. Compare and contrast this to the Roman-Persian Wars, which lasted in total 681 years. With the Middle East being a fair battleground between our two combatants, we now need to look at the combatants themselves. Who exactly are we dealing with here? What are their skills, the loadout, and do either of them have any little tricks up their sleeves? First, let's take a look at your standard Roman legionary. We're not talking about a gang of reckless, greedy sellswords here, nor are we discussing a terrified gang of teenagers drafted into service by an oppressive ruler. Roman legionaries were volunteer troops, half from Rome proper and half from other territories in the empire, referred to as the Auxilia. These soldiers are highly trained, highly organized, and highly motivated, both by a sense of national and military pride or, in the Auxilia's case, the opportunity to be rewarded with full-blown Roman citizenship and the status and wealth that came with being a highly regarded member of the empire's heavy infantry. The Roman Empire was actually more progressive than many of today's world powers in the monetary bonuses they offered to their soldiers as motivation for their service. Service. And of course, while being well motivated and having a good payment plan won't necessarily give our Roman underdogs the edge over an M1 Abrams tank, it certainly won't hurt their chances either. Soldiers that actually want to fight tend to fight better than conscripted armies. Now we know the Roman legionnaires were highly trained and revered infantrymen, but what about their actual equipment loadout? Well, in terms of armor, your standard Roman legionary would typically be fit with a chainmail underlayer, topped either by shoulder pads or in more extreme cases the army's trademark lorica segmentata. This is the term for the steel strips folded into light but powerful body armor, the appearance of which is actually pretty synonymous with the mental image of a Roman soldier, from Gladiator to Monty Python. They also wore helmets that covered their entire head, brow, and neck, leaving only the face exposed. Down below they kept it pretty simple with a leather belt and hobnailed sandals. Another iconic element of the Roman legionary armor is the scutum, a huge curved rectangular shield formed of densely packed layers of plywood, allowing the legionary to not only shield their entire body but to form complex shield structures with their fellow legionnaires, though we'll delve more into that later. Equally important as the defense is the Roman legionary's capacity for offense. That's right, we're talking weapons. What kind of weapons did these legends of the military world wield, and would they hold any water against the M1 Abrams tank? For warriors so feared, the Roman legionnaires kept things pretty minimalist in their weaponry. Each legionary carried two javelins known as pilums designed with an armor-piercing pyramidal head on the end of a long metal shaft. 
Legionnaires would be trained to throw these javelins with devastating accuracy, before charging into battle whatever's left at close range. This they do with the help of their gladius, a short sword designed for stabbing rather than hacking or slashing. As a last resort, the standard legionary is typically packing a pugio, a stout dagger designed once again for stabbing. Considering that most of the Roman army's offensive potential is based around stabbing, how would they fare against an enemy that could not be stabbed, such as an M1 Abrams tank? We've seen what the Roman legionnaires are capable of. Now let's take a look at the M1 Abrams, also known as the M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. This piece of terrifying hardware has been a mainstay of the US ground force since the 90s. Operated by a crew of four, this tank is capable of moving at max speeds of 42 miles per hour or 69 kilometers per hour thanks to its 1500 horsepower gas turbine engine, almost double the speed of the fastest human ever measured. Considering the Roman legionnaires are literally foot soldiers, being massively outpaced by a far stronger foe definitely isn't a good sign. But things will get worse for our plucky legionnaires. When you consider the Abrams armor, weighing 68 tons, the tank boasts thick metal armor designed to withstand improvised explosive devices, rocket-propelled grenades, and enemy tank fire. The latest iteration is also fitted with M250 six-barreled smoke grenade dischargers, allowing it to create a blinding smoke screen around itself at a moment's notice. A thrown pilum is likely to inflict the same damage as flicking a toothpick at it, much to the frustration of the unfortunate Roman legionnaires. And don't even think about going at it with a gladius unless you like the idea of being crushed. Well, that finally brings us to the weaponry you can expect from a modern M1 Abrams, namely a devastating cannon and two different but equally dangerous machine guns. There's the M256 120mm smoothbore cannon, capable of firing M829A4 advanced kinetic energy and advanced multi-purpose or amp rounds that would likely turn a gang of even the toughest legionnaires into a fine red mist. The two secondary weapons are the 12.7 mm machine gun and the 7.62mm M240 machine gun, both of which could dish out a devastating level of damage to combatants without modern ballistic armor like the Legionnaires. It seems like an almost depressingly one-sided battle. In theory, couldn't a single one of these high-tech death machines mow their way through the entire Roman Empire? Well, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, definitely. But the story is never that simple. Two key factors in this battle are numerical advantages and battle tactics. A Roman legion is formed of an impressive 5,000 troops divided into cohorts of 480, each of which is then divided into centuries of 80 to 100 troops. Much like modern infantry, this allows for not only a large overall force, but a great degree of independence between them, and that allows for impressive tactical versatility. An M1 Abrams is a devastating piece of military technology, but it can only fight one battle at a time, and its greatest defensive weapons, the smoothbore cannon and its two machine guns, have finite ammunition. Any method of defeating the M1 Abrams tank would likely lean on this vast numerical superiority, with the ability to act independently and draw the tank's attention as necessary. The problem with many of the Roman Legion's most well-known tactics is that they simply weren't designed with a combatant like a tank in mind. Take for example the testudo or tortoise formation, wherein the legion converges and interlocks their shields to deflect projectiles as they move toward their targets. While this would have worked fine for spears and arrows and other non-explosive hand-thrown projectiles, the plywood scutums wouldn't offer much protection against a hail of bullets or the blast of the tank's cannon, or even just the crushing weight of the tank's tracks. The same can be said for other traditional tactics, like the triple line and wedge formation. Tanks are a piece of technology so immune to conventional weapons that a whole new class of anti-tank weaponry had to be built to deal with them. However, there is one feather in the Roman legion's cap, long-term endurance. In addition to their weaponry and armor, each legionary would carry a pila muralia, a forked pole carrying miscellaneous supplies including up to 14 days of rations, a wicker basket, a saw, a length of leather, a shovel, a sickle, and a water skin. Legionnaires would also carry a pickaxe around their belt. These supplies would not only allow the legionnaires to survive on the battlefield for two weeks, but would also give them the tools to live longer off the natural resources presented to them by the land around them. It's worth remembering that this particular showdown is happening in the mountainous terrain of the Middle East, where adaptable guerrilla-style forces have always had an advantage. The 5,000-man legion could split into small and maneuverable centuries, allowing it to wage a stealthy and covert war of attrition on the M1 Abrams from the hills, making occasional tactical sacrifices, but preserving the majority of their forces. For highly trained soldiers up against a noisy and large tank, remaining alert and hidden shouldn't be that challenging a task. An interesting fact worth remembering about the M1 Abrams tank is that much like the ammo supplies that power its dangerous weaponry, the very fuel that allows the tank to move is equally finite. 
The tank's engine has great mileage by all accounts, but ultimately can only really last for 265 miles before needing to refuel. And while the M1 is actually extremely versatile in its fuel it can utilize, including gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel, you're highly unlikely to find any of these lying around on the battlefields of ancient Iran or Iraq. And here, the Roman Legion has its perfect advantage, because even if the tank did potentially have reserves of fuel and ammunition elsewhere, the tank would be seriously vulnerable while replenishing their supplies. If the legionnaires could keep their sentries spread out and mobile around the battlefield, considering their vast numerical advantage of 5,000 to 1, they could deplete the tank's ammunition and fuel until all that was left was a stationary metal hut. At that point, it becomes a type of battle that the ancient warriors are more familiar with, siege warfare. The Roman Legion would simply camp out around the now immobilized tank, possibly even digging trenches around it with their shovels in order to further prevent its escape, until the four operators of said tank ran out of supplies like food and water. Then they'd have only two choices, go out fighting against the numerically superior force of highly trained melee combatants or surrender to the Roman forces and be captured. Either way, in spite of having inferior weapons and armor in pretty much every regard, this is how a Roman legion, through leveraging its numerical superiority and tactical flexibility, could defeat an M1 Abrams tank. The question of what these legionnaires will do with their newly captured M1 Abrams tank is probably a discussion for another video. Hungry for more tank knowledge? Check out the top 10 most powerful tanks and the deadliest tank of World War II. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.